This is the Bash U bucket list from Lake Chickamauga in Tennessee. Stay tuned. I hope you guys have as much fun watching it as we did filming it. Pete Gluzek for the Bash U bucket list, Southern Tennessee. Walked in and asked my dad, I said, you know, I said, I'm struggling with this. He said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want to fish for a living. He goes, well, he said, I can tell you, he was at 40 something at the time. He said, uh, life's too short to be unhappy. And he said, if that's what you want to do, he said, you need to focus all your energy and efforts into it and, and go for it. He said, you can always look back and if you didn't make it, you can say you tried. And he said, that's the way life is. He says, go for it. So I walked in, I quit. and. I went to beating nails and driving bulldozers and pouring concrete and all that, you know, just to make ends meet. And uh, I, I, I made a run at being a professional bass fisherman. And I asked the good Lord in the beginning, if you just let me make a living doing what I love to do, that's all I'll ask for. And 20 something years later, here I am. Man, it's, uh, it sounds like your, your dad was a huge influence from young, taking you fishing and, and uh, helping you make this big decision. Uh, it sounds like he's always been an important influence in yeah, your life. Dad has been a very important influence in my life. Uh, you know, a good godly man. And, and and I have to give credit to my mom too. My mom, there's been, like I talked about that 14 foot John boat. Once we got about, uh, when I got about 14, 13 or 14, he actually bought us a, a six horsepower Everood motor for the boat. I still didn't have a trailer motor, but uh, we weren't allowed to be in the boat by ourselves. And so during summer break, I can remember you know, days upon end, my mom would go out in that John boat with us and, and sit in the 100 degree weather while me and my brother fished. And, and uh, you know, I just, I, I'm very fortunate that I had a family that uh, supported my dreams and, and stuff like that. So I uh, can't just give all the credit to dad. Mom had a lot to do with it too. Man, family, I know my family had a big role in my development too. Um, a few months after marrying your wife, uh, you were broke and afraid you were going to starve. Uh, I, I know we've all been through this. If you've tried this sport, what happened to you? And uh, and tell us about it. You know, it's just, uh, you know, at the time, you know, I think I was fishing, you know, early on in my career. Um, you know, it, 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 things weren't, aren't where they're at right now, you know, as far as in the professional bass fishing world, you know, payouts weren't as good. I mean, first place was, but, you know, from second to the, the to, to the lower payouts well, wasn't that good. I mean, our entry fees weren't quite as high, but, uh, you know, there, there's times, you know, uh, I was working two jobs and then trying to fish, and, you know, it, it's, it, I don't even know how I survived. I'll be honest with you. I don't know how I made it. I mean, it's by the grace of the good Lord that we made it. I, don't, I mean, she was a hard worker, and probably if it wasn't for her, you know, you know, her hard work and her job, uh, we pro I, pro I probably wouldn't have made it. You know, there's been times she wasn't she wasn't too fired up about the bass fishing thing either. You know, she what she didn't really understand it, and you know, and I had a you know my dream was to make it doing this, and I didn't really know how I was going to make it, and and lo and behold, in 2002, I won FLW at at, uh, at Lake Washita, and uh, that's when she saw the light. I won $110,000, and. Uh, then her eyes were opened, and she was she got a little bit more behind the bass fishing, and and since then she's really she's really got on board, and things have been very very we've been very fortunate and blessed to be where we're at now. That's awesome. I, I went broke three times myself <laughs> in this game. <laughs> I, I never I never had to file bankruptcy, but boy, I thought one time I was going to, and everybody told me, said, "You, if you can keep from it, don't do it." I mean, I I had a truck repossessed. All you people out there, it's in financial struggles. I know what that's like. I had a truck repossessed. Uh, you know, working two jobs, trying to pay for a truck, trying to pay for you know your your house, and you know, I'm, I'm not proud of that. But I was young, and I didn't really understand all the the financial part, financial parts of uh, of everything that goes on. So I regret that that happened. But it was a it was a it was a it was a good lesson that I learned. You know, so. You know, just because something like it happens to you doesn't mean you can't get back on your feet and, 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 and be successful at something.
Next up, we're talking with Mike Jolly from Tennessee Fish and Game. He's going to be talking to us about the different types of forage foods that the largemouth love to feed on this lake and the Florida strain bass that live here and is one of the reasons why these fish get so big. How has Chickamauga changed over the years from a bass fishing perspective? Chickamauga Reservoir has always been a very uh, consistent reservoir for bass fishing. Um, what's really changed now since the onset of the Florida Bass Stocking Program that started in the year 2000 is the size structure of the fish within the reservoir. Uh, a, a, lot, a lot of fish now over that five and eight pound size range, which was one of the project goals when we started stocking the Florida Bass in the year 2000. So Chickamauga has always had good spawning sites available. Um, it's always had good growth rates with the bass that's there, a lot because of the forage base with the gizzard and threadfin shad that are available. Um, it's always had uh, good recruitment in the juvenile fish successful through the winter time and the year classes uh, continue to be produced within the reservoir. Uh, so what's changed uh, mostly is the size structure, more bigger bass now. Chickamauga has always been uh, a really high productive reservoir for largemouth bass, but the size structure has changed dramatically uh, since the Florida Bass Project started in the year 2000. So what we found on Chickamauga Reservoir through genetic surveys as we monitor this Florida Bass Project is it's the F1, which is a cross between the pure Florida and the pure northern, uh, which was the pre-existing population here. We're mostly pure northern, but we did have a little bit of Florida uh, influence even in the pre-existing population, but it was minimal. So what we've seen through our surveys, is, genetic surveys, is that F1 hybrid uh, is the fastest growing fish. It achieves the greatest size. It's not the pure Floridas, ironically enough, that we've stocked over 3 million pure Floridas since the year 2000 in the Chickamauga Reservoir, but it's not the pure Floridas that are making the contribution uh, to the larger size. It's really these hybrids that we're seeing. Uh, that are bigger. And even um, fish that we see with, with less than 50% of that Florida gene influence in them are still growing faster than the largemouth that were in Chickamauga Reservoir prior to the year 2000 before we started this project. Up next, we're going to be talking with Billy Wheat, the premier guide here on Lake Chickamauga. He's going to be talking to us about his proven secrets to be successful catching those giant Lake Chickamauga bass which put this lake on the Bass University bucket list. I would say as far as the numbers of big bass that we have, it's probably at its peak. But I've seen one, I've seen some fish in here that I would say that would push the uh, 17, 18 pound mark. And I'm sure that they have came and went and, and actually died. And I've actually, I've had the, last year I probably had, my clients probably had 12 opportunities to probably break the record that's 15-3 and it's going to get broken. It's going to get shattered because somebody's going to catch one of those great big ones. I don't think there's a whole lot of the big ones like are the high teens, but there is a lot of 10 and 11 pound fish in this lake right now. And we're seeing more and more every year. So I think it's just, I think instead of the decline, like some people say that it's, going, that it's getting, it's actually getting better with the big fish. It's turning into more of a trophy lake. So. I like that because I'm a guide and everybody wants to catch a big one, so we're good. Yeah, we, we normally, when we target, when I go out with a client just to target the big fish, uh, we're usually throwing baits from, from 5 inches to 12 inches long. So that's swim bait wise. This lake is a swim bait lake. I mean, at the bottom line, if you want to catch a big fish here, you, you stock up with all the best quality swim baits that you can get, including gliders, um, ploppers, anything big that catches big fish and you, you throw them because you're looking for the opportunity for that. So, I mean, a, a 10 inch bait's nothing because on this particular lake, we have uh, 10, 12, 14 inch golden shiners. And it's like, we have 10, 12, 14 inch uh, gizzard shad. You know, so you can't, you can't have a too, you know, too big of a bait here because th these are giants. I mean, they eat whatever they want to. They're the top of the chain. I mean, the ones that, the giants that are here now are here. They're here right now. There's no folklore. You see them, you see them day in, day out. 14 pounder here, 12 pounder here. This is the land of the giants. And if you want to catch a giant, this is where you need to be. And it doesn't matter what month. People call me all the time, say, hey man, what month? You know, hey, we catch big ones in the middle of summer, you know. 
because this this is this is a, a whole deal. I do a lot of work with with Tennessee Tech and their biologists. These fish here run a 160 day spawning ro uh, rotation. 160 days. When they start, you've got another 160 days of these fish rotating through beds. Well, if you wanna get the closest thing to Florida, you go from Highway 60 Bridge up to the dam, we call it the jungle. That's what it is, it's the jungle. It's full of lily pads, choked with grass, it's shallow. I mean, it's all the nasty stuff, stumps, anything that you want, big shallow creeks. You get to the middle of the lake, you're gonna get more into like dragging a Carolina rig, drop shotting, you know, and, and fishing some offshore stuff. But the big major creeks, well, the big creeks are what make up this, this whole river system. You know, the, the creeks here are really big. You got five mile long creeks, you know, in these places. And uh, they're the place where you can go and really, really kick back, you know, throw a shaky head. Um, get into to the backs, into some grass, you know, come fall time, uh, um, anywhere on the lake really, the grass is going to be here. What, what I think about the bottom end of the lake is uh, you get into a more of a lake environment, you know, it kind of spreads out a little more, kind of slows down a little bit, you know, and, and uh, you really have to do more looking with your grass and stuff to offshore fish, you know, because there's a lot of, lot of humps and ledges and drops down there that, that require a lot of electronic work, you know, as you come up the lake, you're going to get a little bit more out of that because, you know, it's really hard to see these fish on these real sharp river ledges. But, you know, if you want to catch smallmouth, you head toward the dam always on any Tennessee River dam. But um, the big, the big giant bass, I mean, if you're into flipping, pitching, once the water comes up here and, you know, May 14th is uh, when we go into full pool and November 14th is when we drop into winter pool. So, you know, from, from May 14th, all the way up through November the 14th. Just get your big stick out and swing. Big it, big it. It's not a five, but it's a three. Woo. It's not a five, but it's a three pounder. This flake's full of those right there. That's close to a three. I've kind of built a reputation or a career out of being able to get into hard to reach places to uh, to access bass that a lot of people don't 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 normally fish for, and uh, and normally in the time in the time of year that you normally wouldn't do it. So I'm going to go uh, over some of the things that I've learned through the years on how to get in these areas, and uh, you know with the mapping and stuff we have now, it's kind of a little bit easier to get in these areas, but there still are places that that aren't mapped and. Uh, I'm going to show you how to kind of what to look for and, and what to do, how to get in there, and, and, and uh, just the, the things that I've learned over the years. So uh, hang with us here, and I'm going to go, go over these and uh, try to give you a better understanding of how uh, streams and rivers and, and things lay out and how to, to be able to read them and, and, and get into those hard to reach places. We're going to take this one creek here. It's kind of mapped out pretty good, but I'm going to go through here and kind of show you what you look for. Um, as I'm going into one of these creeks, or, or say a river, and say it's an un, it's an unmapped river, what, what I'm looking for is like, like I'm I, as I'm headed into it, I'm kind of visually looking at the surrounding, the shoreline. Is it rocky? Is it is it is there a lot of a lot of, of wood in the water? Is there, you know, I'm trying to look at the, the topography of the ground and see how it lays out. And then also, once I get on in there and I see my depth finder starting to get shallower and shallower and shallower, then I'm looking ahead and I'm trying to see the way the way uh, streams and rivers and, and stuff like that work is you, is you have a channel. And uh, when you get hard flow, that channel cuts out different places on the way it runs through the creek. And so as I'm going in, like we're going into this one, there's some big rocks on the right here. I notice on the other side, it's kind of flat. It's a lot of sand, a lot of pea gravel. And so now I'm looking, so I know over here where this, I, I can look and the bank's more on a 45. So I know that more than likely that that's the side that the deep water's on. And as I get, approach that and I get on this side, you know, the water gets deeper. As you can see on my graph, my Lawrence graph and the sea map, I can see that this side's deep. Now when we get on back past it and we get into here, it's gonna get, it just goes into like just nothing but a shallow flat. Well, that, that shows a shallow flat, but there's still, there's, there, more than likely, there's some deeper water, there's a channel that cuts through there. So now when I get on back to the flat, 
I'm doing the same thing. I'm looking to see if there's a shoreline for the where there's a steeper bank. So if I see a steeper bank, I'm gonna try to visually try to look in my mind like how I would envision that creek channel run through. So I know more than likely that that creek channel is gonna go in and hit against that bank. And now, once it hits against this bank, I'm looking, I'm either looking ahead of me or I'm looking to the other side to see if I can see another bank that's got a 45. And I'm trying to play out in my mind at what part does this channel turn and go over to that side. And I don't always do this on my big motor. A lot of times I'm doing this on my, on my, on my trolling motor. I'm trying to, trying to do it on the trolling motor. And, and sometimes this is not an easy process. This is not a, a quick process. This may take me, it may take me an hour or two hours to get into a place to figure out how to get into it. But once I figure it out, I've got it mapped out, you know, on my trail and how I got in there. And when I come back out, I'll save the trail in a different color. And that way I know that's the right way to get in there. And uh, a lot of this is just trial and error. And it's not a given that you're gonna catch them when you get back in these places, but uh, there's certain things that you look for when you get into these areas that, uh, that are better than others. Um, and another tip that I can give you about being in these places is that when you get way back in these places, uh, you may fish for a mile and never get a bite. You may fish for two miles and never get a bite, but there will be a stretch Throughout the history of me doing this, or me, the, the, the stuff that I've learned, there will be a stretch, or maybe two stretches, or three stretches. For some reason, in the backs of these areas, these fish will get in 50 to 100 yard stretches where they're just there. And I don't know why it is, but that's just where they want to live. And you may fish a mile of stuff that looks just like what you just got bit on, but that's just, for some reason, that's where they live. That's where they want to live. And a lot of things that people don't realize is, is a lot of these areas, once you get back in them, they'll drop off deeper. And everybody thinks, and it, for the most part it's true, a lot of your fish migrate out of the main lake into a creek and spawn. But you have a certain percentage of fish that migrate from the creek into the lake to spawn. Now that seems weird, but that happens. You got fish that, that will live in a creek their whole life, and then when the water comes back up, if you're on a, a system that, like the TVA system that comes up and down, they'll live in that creek, and then once the water comes out, they'll pull out of that creek, they'll spawn on the flat, and then they'll go back to the creek. Not all the fish live in the lake. Some fish, you got resident fish that live in the creeks all the time, or little streams or, or smaller rivers. So it, it, that's the one thing I can tell you is uh, don't be afraid to go in places that a lot of other people won't, because sometimes those are the hidden gems that, you know, when you find them, it's just like, oh, they, I got it all to myself, and it's, just, it's, a, it's an amazing place to fish. Well, uh, you know, the water coming up and going down has a lot to do with the way the fish's attitudes or behavior. Uh, in my experiences, um, anytime you have a, rise, a slow rising water, the fishing's always better than it is when on like a, like a fast rise. Um, a slow fall's good too, a fast fall's not good. Anytime it does something really fast, Unless it's in, let's say the month of May, May, June, July, August. In the summer months, if you have a really fast rising water and it rises real fast and gets way up in the bushes, you can expect some really good fishing because the fish follow it up. But as for in the spring, when you have a real fast rise like that, a lot of times those fish won't go with that water. They'll stay on the original shoreline where they're at. They won't, they won't follow it up because, because they know it's coming back down. They get conditioned to that in the spring. See, we pretty much, I followed that all the way around. There's been a creek channel all the way around there. I've just been watching my graph. When I got it shallow, I come back out a little bit more. We're at two and a half foot now. And this is the other thing. When you get in places like this, like I know I'm in a flat right now, now I can visually look and see there's another creek coming out of there, and I know there's a creek coming out of there, so I know more than likely that channel that comes out of there is gonna come straight out for a ways. It's not gonna come straight out and turn. It's usually gonna come straight out. So, and here's another one here. Any, if you can find where these two intersect, that's usually a good spot too.
There's a lot of, looks like there's a lot of isolated pieces of wood and stuff out in the water. It's always good. Got shallower. Cut back to my right. See, I just followed that creature. It got up to 1.5 and I dropped this way and went to two and a half foot. And there's no mapping on this. Like it's just straight blue. The straight shows a flat. Mm-hmm. Carpatolis. I have seen it when they gang up big time, like this is early, this is middle of April. I have seen it where they're gang up right at the mouth of one of these things too. Waiting for the water to come up to go spawn. Well, I can tell you this, it's a good idea if you're gonna do this kind of fishing. I can't tell you how not to get stuck, but I can tell you how to get unstuck. It's always not, you know, as you can see, I'll show you there in a minute, I got a, I carry a push pole I got mounted behind my seats. Uh, that's a good way to get unstuck without having to get, without having to get out and get wet. Uh, it's never fun to get out and get wet in February, you know, for, uh, for getting stuck. So, see, just like I said, it's a, uh, just went into four and a half foot of water right here in front of the, right here in front of this bridge. So this should be the last deep water. Just me guessing, this should be the last deep water before I get underneath the bridge. So Yep, this seem look at see him chasing it. Did you see that and chasing that? Uh, just saw one chasing the shad on the other side of the bridge until he got him. Doosh. It does, but I, I think it's gonna be all she wrote because I can see I see logs sticking on sticking up off the bottom. You can't really go much further. The water was up just a tad more. We could go all the way to the back of this thing, but it's not. The water's two foot down, so. You don't want to be afraid to go as far as you can go. Catch bass like that. And if you, as you can tell by the sounds of my power poles, it's rock. There's another. One. Looks like I should have come in here during a major league fishing event. Right. It's another good thing about power poles. I don't gotta go back there and reach and pull something down or anything. I can just hit a button and trim down and.
Hey, what's that? Yeah, well, it'll, it'll change and then it'll go back out the other way. Buzz bait. Huh? No, it's just like, it's, sometimes it's wind. Like that wind will start blowing hard and then it'll, it lets up, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's just, it's just where the wind's blowing. Dang it. Never too early for a buzz bait. <laughs> That's why you go try to get into the hard to reach places where nobody goes. You're welcome, Bass University. That was awesome. The way I look at it is in, in the summertime, I'm wanting a place where cooler water's coming in, because a lot of times the, the, the lake water's super hot, so a lot of times these fish will migrate in here to get in the cooler water. Uh, the other thing is in the winter time, is you gotta have some deep water. Somewhere it has to shoal up and get into some deeper water where those fish have, have like a maybe seven, eight, nine, ten foot hole of water to be in. And in the winter time, it's a whole lot slower fishing. It ain't just like you're gonna pull in here and throw a buck a buzz bait and catch one it's just it, you're gonna have to throw like a, a shaky head or a, a small jig or something and fish really extremely slow but uh, there, there's really no wrong time I, you can't say that's like saying well what what's the right time of year to be at this one lake it, there's really no wrong time to be there it's just the way you fish it and how you fish it you know and and, and certain characteristics you look for you look for some that's got and like I said, deeper water in the wintertime in the backs of them. Uh, really, the summertime, it really doesn't matter. It's like, I like the cooler, the cooler creeks, like where the water drops at, like, at least like five to 10 degrees where it gets a little bit cooler. So uh, the fall, the fall is really one of the best times to target these places because a lot of those shad run to the backs of these creeks and that's really one of the best times to fish them. Uh, is the backs of things like that. You know, you got your small shad migrated back there. They're a little bit harder to catch, the fish are, but uh, a lot of times, you know, like I said, the fall is the best time to be there. But the thing about this environment is the food, man. It's the food. I mean the food. You know, you, it, when the water, when the winter time drops in and into that winter pool, and they, they know that all those big flats and everything are done, and it's gonna bring all those big shiners and those big shad in there. They're going. They're, they're coming up, but when it when it goes back, you now when the post spawn happens, when the post spawn happens, that's when you get out there with that swim bait. The best is a five and a seven. Get you a five and a seven inch swim bait. Get out there, fish those muscle beds. You don't big sack them. You get out there and fish those muscle beds. You'll be a more consistent bite out there anyway. So, muscle bed fishing, three quarter one ounce jig. Yeah, big worm on a big shaky head. Like I mean, it's nothing for us to throw fourteen inch worms. So, how deep? Uh, that'll be anywhere from 5 to 25, depending on the area. Will so, mussels turn into 25 uh, it's, it's not that they grow there, they, they go there because of the out of current place and the hard bottom. Yeah, there are, there are mussel beds that are 25 foot deep, yeah. Tennessee uh, is very diverse in, in fisheries. It has over 325 species of uh, fish across the state, which is more than any other inland state uh, in the nation. But it also has uh, a very diverse set of uh, mussels that represent the Tennessee River, Cumberland River drainages. Um, and it's very specific to certain areas, what kind of mussels inhabit those areas. It's a good source of determining what kind of water quality we have. 
but those muscles and uh, they've been very uh, instrumental in the in the whole ecosystem and cycle, uh, being host and different things for a different kind of uh, larvae, and they also uh, so it's a very diverse set of mussels that we have in the state of Tennessee here. Well the Tennessee River is noted for shell beds and then and what that is is that's an, an active shell bed where uh, these mussels they they, they I, I, to be honest with you, you don't really know why they do it but they get on certain spots and I don't even know how a mussel swims or goes where it goes but all I know is that uh, these shell beds are a very important part of the ecosystem here. Uh, the, the, the shell crackers spawn in them, the the, the shadow spawn in them. Bass will actually spawn in them too, uh, but they, they're just hard spots on the river. And for some reason, the bass like to get on those hard spots. It's not rock, it's actually shells. And they like to get, there's something in those shells. I don't know if the crawfish come to them or what, or it attracts the bait fish, but uh, the bass definitely love being on those shell beds. That's just something that's uh, notorious for the Tennessee River. And uh, it's an it plays an important role here on Chickamauga too. How, is it a crankbait bait on the shell it, uh, beds? The, how, how do you fish them? You know, shell beds are uh, no. It, it's not one thing on the shell bed. Sometimes it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a swing head jig, or a, it could be a football jig. It could be a crankbait. It could be a swim bait. It's just trying to trick those bass that are on the shell beds into into biting. Usually, when you can get one activated, you can get the whole school activated. What's so neat about the lake is <clears throat> I've got to watch these fish grow like when they first started stocking them, and we knew the record was gonna get broke. We knew the record, the, the state record was gonna be broke on Chickamauga because you could see it progress. Like, you started seeing a lot of sevens, and then a lot of eights, and then a lot of nine pounders, and then all of a sudden you seen all these tens being called every spring, like this time of year in April, Mar uh, February, March, April, you saw all these tens and elevens being called, and then you started seeing twelves and thirteens being called. So you could see that, that initial stocking program, that, that age class of fish as it's matured and got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, you saw them grow up and you know, like, it'll probably be broke again. I mean, it's been, it's come close two or three times this year being broke, you know, the state record being broke again. So I don't see why somebody don't catch a 17, 18 pound bass out of, out of Chickamauga. I think, I think it will happen. That's an awesome, that's an awesome ending. What is the state record by the way? It was at four, it was a high 14s for the longest time. It was caught out of uh, a lake in West Tennessee, and then it was uh, it, it was broke. It was broke here, and it got close to being broke right after Gabe broke it. Another guy caught a 15 something and got close to breaking it again. But there was a 14, God, there was a 14 40, like a 14 and a half pounder caught this spring, released alive. Uh, there's even a video of it being released alive, and uh, so, like I said. You never know, it could be broke again within the next year or two. Uh, I foresee a, a, an even bigger bass being caught. But if you want to catch that bass in Chickamauga, you're not going to do it in January, you're not going to do it in the summertime. It's always going to be January, February, March, or April. This, this is a good one. Uh, I, had a dude, I had a dude show up here. We, we, backed, in, we backed into the uh, water here, and it, it's cold, it's a rig season. So I, I'm tying on here. We ain't been in the water three minutes. I tie a rig on, you know, the Dayton Boat Dock rig, Big Daddy's Custom Baits, and I, I'd sit there and I hand, hand do the rod. He's just standing here holding his rod. I'm sitting here tying other guys' stuff up, you know, and we're all talking, you know, blah, 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 you know, this and that. Yeah, we're gonna catch some pretty good today, you know. And all of a sudden the fish, this is, this is 42 degree water. All of a sudden the fish start blowing up all around the boat. He's like, oh my God, what's going on? I said, dude, throw at that big swirl right there. This is first cast of the morning. He throws over, 10.30 takes off. There you go. I said, hey brother, you might as well just buy me a 12 pack. I'm going back to the house. You're done. <laughs> you know, uh, the guys wanted me to talk a little bit about this. This is uh, to, to just somebody watching this, this just, just looks like an ordinary ball. But, but what this is, is uh, this is a sock ball. And it's actually made out of a sock. Uh, uh, my, my grandfather, which is my dad's dad, they grew up in the Depression. And I, and I, I pulled this out yesterday when we was fishing, uh, Pete and Mark and Jeff, and I said, uh, 
They just looked at it and said, what is that? And I said, well, it's, it's a sock ball and uh, it's made out of a sock. So what this is, is uh, <clears throat> my, grand, my grandfather, when he was growing up, they got one pair of socks, one pair of socks a year. That's all they got. And, and times was so hard that they, they couldn't afford balls or, you know, you know just general stuff that like, we take for granted now. So what they would do is at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the winter time when they went barefooted, you know, during the summer they went barefooted, they didn't have shoes. So they would, uh, they would take their socks and they would unravel it and they'd take a piece of, they'd find a piece of rubber or something and they'd, they'd wrap that piece of rubber till they made them a ball. So uh, I carry this with me. He made me about probably, I don't know, he probably made me 10 of these. And I carry one with me everywhere I go because, uh, I, you know, I said this yesterday, if you, forget where you, if you forget where you came from, you'll never get where you're going. So I keep that with me. He's been dead for, for a while, so I keep it with me always. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed the Bass University bucket list here on Lake Chickamauga. Uh, it, was a, it was an amazing time visiting with Wesley Strader, visiting with Billy Wheat, uh, talking with local fish and game experts, learning about this lake, this lake that is so special, that is one of the gems in this country and certainly in Southeast Tennessee, putting out giants. It's called Lake Chickamauga. It's awesome. And I hope you enjoyed it. This is Pete Kluzek for the Bash University Bucket List.